Steam locomotives ruled for over 150 years in Britain, where of course the railway was invented. Developed for moving coal from the mine to the pit head, the steam locomotive grew into a racing thoroughbred by the 1930s. Gresley's famous Mallard achieved 126 miles per hour in 1938, a world record for steam which still stands today. But by 1968, it was all over. In August that year, the last British Railway steam locomotives had been withdrawn. But the steam engine refused to die. It has character. It's the nearest thing to a living machine that we've ever invented. Drivers and firemen use brains as well as brawn to generate power from fire and water. It's still a machine that excites the greatest of passions. Railway and wildlife artist David Shepherd. I'm old enough to remember a very sad time indeed, 1968, when it was the end of our proud and great railway heritage, our steam railway heritage. It had to go, it was dirty, it was inefficient, but I don't think you can sweep aside romance and nostalgia either. It had to go simply because diesels are more efficient and clean. But I'm proud to have been one of the people who was able to save just a vestige of that great steam age to give pleasure to young people growing up now in a very functional age. We're trying to keep a little bit of nostalgia alive and memories of the past. And my engine, Black Prince, is one of those engines. I'm very proud to have been able to achieve that. People come up to me and say, you're completely bananas, you know. And I am, I'm eccentric, bananas, crazy. Because I go around patting Black Prince and people say, how can you pat a, a machine? Well, I love Black Prince, and the steam aficionados will understand when I say that. You can love a steam engine. It's very emotional because of the pleasure it gives. I mean, here and wherever she goes, she gives pleasure to untold thousands of people. So I love her. She's part of the family. I love her as much as my children and my grandchildren. Right from the start, railways always created very strong feelings. Many warmly welcomed the new age, but others were violently opposed to the iron horse. The basic steam engine can be traced back to the 18th century, when it began life as a stationary engine, used for pumping water or hauling loads at mine shafts. It wasn't until 1825 that the iron railway and the steam engine came together under Geordie engineer George Stevenson. On September 27th that year, the world's first public steam railway opened between Stockton and Darlington. Locomotion is a steam locomotive at its most basic, with its two cylinders each linked to a pair of driving wheels by overhead beams and rods. But it was obvious to everyone that this was a quantum leap over anything that had gone before. Locomotion was powerful enough to haul 34 wagons with great success and panache in front of huge crowds all along the line. In 1975, a modern reproduction of locomotion was built for the Stockton and Darlington Railway's 150th anniversary celebrations at nearby Shildon. Besides being driven by separate cylinders, the pairs of driving wheels are connected by coupling rods. If there's one pioneer engine even more famous than locomotion, it must be Rocket, designed by George Stevenson's son, Robert. The world's first passenger railway, the Liverpool and Manchester, was being built, and in 1829 the directors set up the Rainhill Trials on a completed section of the line. They wanted to determine the best kind of locomotive for their new intercity railway. Rocket won hands down. Gone were the overhead beams and rods of locomotion. Both cylinders acted directly onto the same pair of wheels. There was now a long tube boiler, a separate firebox at one end and a smoke box at the other. The basics of the modern steam locomotive were all now successfully combined. For the first time, man could now safely travel faster than a horse could gallop. It really was the start of a new age.
Rocket was retired to a permanent home at the Science Museum in London. But in the 1920s, he was brought out to star in this pageant in North Wales, propelled by another historic engine, Cornwall, a Francis Trevithick design dating back to 1847. As a passenger railway, the Liverpool and Manchester needed speed and steady riding from its locomotives, rather than freight hauling power. Lion was built for use on the line by Todd, Kitson and Laird of Leeds in 1838, and it was still able to raise steam for the 150th anniversary of the line in 1980. Luckily, Lion had ended its life as a stationary boiler with the Mersey Docks and Harbour Board, where it was employed right up until 1920. Fortunately, by then the historic value of the locomotive had been realised, and Lion was restored to full working order in 1938. With a tall, elegant chimney and enormous haystack firebox, Lion achieved immortality and international fame as a star in the 1953 Ealing comedy The Titfield Thunderbolt. Slightly younger, being built in 1846, is number three of the old Furnace Railway, a copper knob design from Berries of Liverpool, so called because of the copper covered firebox, which is of the haystack variety, just like Lion. Number three now resides at the National Railway Museum in York but it stood for many years on a plinth in an enormous glass case at Barrow in Furnace Station, where the engine survived a heavy air raid during World War II. The site of the locomotive next morning, standing only slightly scratched amid the ruins, is said to have done the town's morale a power of good. It still carries shrapnel damage today. Though barely 20 years younger, Coppernob's more modern shape is very different indeed from the beam engine on wheels appearance of locomotion. By the middle of Queen Victoria's reign, the steam locomotive had established itself as the express machine we are familiar with today. Hardwick, number 790 of the old London and North Western Railway, was designed by Francis Webb and no fewer than 90 of the type were built by the famous crew works from 1874. This famous class, known as precedents, were described by the eminent author O.S. Nock as one of the most outstanding in the whole history of the steam locomotive on British railways. Although not particularly special in outward appearance, it was a design of the cylinders and valves in particular that gave them an astonishing turn of speed. Hardwick achieved huge acclaim in the railway races to the north of 1895, with record-breaking times over the hills from Crewe to Carlisle, which was once covered at an average of nearly 70 miles per hour, which meant speeds of up to 90 miles an hour. We've now reached the start of the 20th century in our story of steam, for the engine approaching was built in 1902. This C-Class 060 is not an express passenger machine. It's a more humble goods workhorse, built for reliability and easy maintenance. Over a hundred were built at Longhedge Works in Battersea, South London, for the South Eastern and Chatham Railway. After a working life of a full 60 years, 592 now works in retirement on the Bluebell Railway in Sussex. 
where it can be sometimes seen hauling the line's prestigious dining train, made up of Pullman cars and carrying no less than the Golden Arrow name. This glorious Crimson Lake livery is a distinctive hallmark of the old Midland Railway. Number 1000, with its seven foot diameter driving wheels designed for speed, is very much an express passenger design. They were known as compounds because steam from the boiler was first used at high pressure in the middle cylinder and then for a second time at a lower pressure in the outside cylinders before being exhausted through the chimney. It was used twice. As the 20th century dawned, it was only going to be a matter of time before a steam locomotive breached the magic speed of 100 miles per hour. Although open to some dispute, many feel that the honour fell to this handsome machine, the Great Western Railway's city of Truro. The famous and much contested exploit took place on the morning of the 9th of May 1904 on an ocean mail special from Plymouth Docks to London Paddington. In these days of air travel we never think twice about the transporting of mail to and from America and all over the world. But a century ago it was all done by ship and train and the mails had top priority. City of Truro's special train was loaded with post and bullion from the German liner Kronprinz Wilhelm and on the long gradual downhill stretch east of Wellington in Somerset, City of Truro was claimed to have topped 102 miles an hour. So how does a steam locomotive actually work? The principle is actually just the same as in Stevenson's locomotion all those years ago. The National Railway Museum has an express locomotive element lines cut away to explain it all. Express steam locomotives consume thousands of gallons of water and around 10 tonnes of coal on each shift. The tender is a large tank with a bunker in its top to carry the coal which the fireman will shovel into the firebox. The tank is full of bracing plates to add the strength needed to contain maybe 17 tonnes of water. Element Line's grate is around 50 square feet in area and it was hard work for a fireman to keep this supplied with coal. It was about the biggest grate capable of being hand fired. If British locomotives had grown any more, mechanical firing would have been inevitable. Fireboxes were made from either copper or steel. This is steel and it's like a room full of fire at the back of the boiler surrounded by its own cavity wall of water, to which the heat passes. The boiler is essentially a long cylinder, through which tubes and flues carry smoke and heat towards the chimney. The numerous tubes create a gigantic heating area. Once the hot gases have passed through the tubes, Together with the smoke from the burning coal, they are ejected through the chimney with each chuff of exhausted steam. Steam rising from the violently boiling water around the firebox is collected at the boiler's highest point, normally known as the dome, even though it's a fairly flat dome on this very tall engine. When the driver opens the regulator, high pressure steam at 250 pounds per square inch flows from dome to smoke box, just behind the chimney. It then flows through internal pipes doubling back through the boiler, almost as far as the firebox. After this, the steam is very dry, superheated and ready for admission to the cylinders. It flows into the steam chest above each cylinder. Steam then alternately flows into and is allowed to escape from the cylinders by the double-headed valve as it moves back and forth. 
This valve alternatively opens and blocks the passageways to the cylinder, where steam moves the piston. Having done its work, steam escapes through the steam chest to the chimney, where it chuffs into the air. The piston's movement is transferred to the connecting rod, which turns the wheels and moves the locomotive. Although the design gradually became more sophisticated over the years, the principles established by the Stevensons in their reciprocating steam engine remained unchanged throughout its life. The big fast machines won the glamour, but there were actually far more humble goods engines, trundling slowly about the length and breadth of the land as they went about their work delivering coal and other goods. There were nearly 200 J36s built in the 1890s for work in eastern Scotland, where some could still be found as late as 1965. There are three pairs of quite small driving wheels, coupled together for power, but without bogies. All the weight is available for traction, and speed is not an issue. And, this being Scotland, there's a rather better covered cab than on many engines of the same period. A very similar design, the J27 dating from 1906, was built for the former Northeastern Railway, and most of the hundred odd engines spent their working lives in the coal fields of Northumberland in County Durham, real Stevenson country. This train is made up of high capacity hopper wagons, a type which the Northeastern Railway pioneered. Built in 1923, this engine is the last of its class, and it survived until 1966. It was bought privately before moving to the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. In 1911, the Midland Railway introduced the first of its famous 4F goods class, of which nearly 800 were built, up to 1941. Absorbed by the London Midland and Scottish Railway, the Midland had a huge geographical spread, and so did the 4Fs, working everywhere from Somerset in the south to Peterborough in the east, and right up through the north to Scotland and the Highlands. These scenes are on the Midland Railway's own main line, a little north of Cheltenham. Here's one at the edge of the Empire, at Radstock, south of Bath on the old Somerset and Dorset line. At this time, around 1960, coal was still being mined. Meanwhile, the Great Western Railway also needed a fleet of powerful freight engines, this time to handle the coal traffic from South Wales. Famous locomotive engineer George Jackson Churchwood introduced the 2800 class in 1903. This time there are four pairs of driving wheels for power and a two-wheel bogey or pony truck at the front to guide the locomotive into curves, points and crossings. These engines were so successful that a second almost identical batch was built as late as the start of the Second World War, with examples from both series surviving up until the very end of Western Steam in the early 1960s. Another very well-known heavy freight type from before the Great War is this Robinson design for the Great Central Railway. 
Built with the coal traffic of the East Midlands in mind, they found work all over the Great Central System. Strong, simple and reliable, they were chosen as the standard freight engine for the army in France in the Great War. Not least because Sir Sam Fay, the Great Central's general manager, was also director of movements at the War Office. More than 500 04s were built by various contractors and, after the war, they went on to give many more years yeoman service, both overseas and back home, where some were still active even as late as 1965. Six three six zero one is the sole survivor in the UK, and it returned to steam on the Great Central Railway after a successful appeal for funds was organised by Steam Railway magazine. Up on the footplate, the driver moves the regulator, admitting steam to the cylinders, and the engine moves off. The controls are simple and basic, and there's not much protection from the weather. No wonder tender first running was avoided wherever possible. You needed to be a hardy soul to be a steam engine driver, ready for long hours of duty at all times of the day and night, and in all weathers. There could be long delays on slow goods work, and your train may frequently be sidelined to let faster traffic pass. The fireman, very much the junior part on the footplate, needed to be fit, with a strong pair of shoulders. On a long journey, he'd shovel several tons of coal into the firebox, and little and often was usually the motto. A traditional mineral train like this would usually run loose coupled. That is, the coupling between each wagon was a simple three-link chain, and, once on the move, the only brakes available would be on the engine and in the guardsman, nothing on the train itself. Handling a long, heavily loaded, loose coupled train demanded skill and experience from the crew, especially where there were gradients. That distinctive three-cylinder beat is the sound of another heavy freight engine. This time, a northeastern railway, Class T3 of 1919, blasting up the 1 in 49 to Gothland on what is now the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. The first line here, engineered by George Stevenson himself, opened in 1836 as a horse tramway and originally climbed this hill by a long rope worked incline. By 1865, steam locomotives had become powerful enough to tackle the work and an orthodox line on a new alignment and with an easier gradient was built. The line was closed as part of the national network in 1965, but was reopened by preservationists just eight years later. The T3s spent all their lives on mineral trains in County Durham, so this sole survivor, withdrawn in 1963, hasn't strayed far. Freight locomotives reached a new era of sophistication during the 1930s, when William Stanier on the London, Midland and Scottish Railway designed his famous 8F class. Stanier's task was to produce a locomotive to be built in large numbers to replace a very mixed fleet of obsolete non-standard designs, and in this the 8F succeeded magnificently. At the start of the Second World War, Stanier's 8F was chosen as the standard freight engine for War Department use, just as Robinson's Great Central design had been chosen 25 years earlier. The intention was to move a large number across the Channel early in the war, but the Allied retreat to Dunkirk prevented this. As a result, hundreds were available to go to the Middle East a few years later, 
where a few survived till the end of the 20th century. Robust and versatile, ATFs were regularly used on passenger services abroad and sometimes in this country too. A handful are preserved on our private railways, including the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway in West Yorkshire. British Movie Tone News. It's May 1932 and the cameras are at King's Cross to see the Flying Scotsman Express leave for Edinburgh. It will cover the 393 mile journey non-stop in 7 hours and 50 minutes, 25 minutes faster than the previous time. An event like this was headline news. For not only did express steam engines have a glamour and excitement all of their own, but railways were the unchallenged number one for long distance journeys. Aviation was in its infancy, while long distance motoring was strictly for the well to do, and it was slow and prone to breakdown at that. Since Victorian times, there'd been great racing rivalry to Scotland between the East Coast Railway companies from King's Cross and the West Coast from Euston. Over the years, the honours came out about even, but any hint of speeding up of schedules was enough to bring the media out in force. The Flying Scotsman was, and indeed still is, the traditional name for the 10 o'clock departure from King's Cross. It's probably the world's most famous name train, and in the summer months it was so busy that it ran in two portions. The first, more glamorous train ran non-stop all the way to Edinburgh, while the second called at places like York and Newcastle. As well as being the name of a train, Flying Scotsman is also, of course, the name of a very famous locomotive, built in 1923 to the design of Nigel Gresley, with the 462 wheel arrangement. This was better known as a Pacific, the best known type for British Express engines. On November 30th, 1934, with a dynamometer car of instruments in the train to measure performance, Flying Scotsman reached the magic 100 miles an hour between Grantham and Peterborough. The first time this speed had been officially recorded. City of Truro's exploit 30 years before had been entirely unofficial. On withdrawal by British Railways in 1963, Flying Scotsman was purchased privately by Alan Pegler and has since starred on many special trains, and indeed, it's the world's most famous steam locomotive. Long, non-stop runs meant that steam locomotives needed to pick up water whilst on the move. This wavy sign warned locomotive crews that water troughs lay ahead, and that the fireman must be ready to wind down the pickup scoop beneath the tender. Troughs were laid between the rails every 40 or 50 miles or so on most of Britain's express main lines. They were just six inches deep, but up to half a mile long, with pumping stations nearby to refill them quickly between trains. At 60 miles an hour, this streamlined engine, one of Gresley's famous A4 class, like Mallard, will collect more than 2,000 gallons of water in just a few seconds. A soaking awaited anyone foolish enough to poke their head out of the window in the leading coaches. Slower and semi-fast services would use the troughs as well, like this one at Langley, near Stevenage.
One railway that didn't use troughs was the Southern, where shorter distances generally meant that costs were not really justified. But to compensate, engines on the longer routes, like Waterloo to Exeter, had larger tenders, nicknamed water carts. This engine, a King Arthur class brand new in 1925, was about to be named Queen Guinevere. The King Arthurs were the Southern's crack passenger engines until the bullied Pacifics came along after 1941 and Salamiel has survived into preservation as part of the national collection. It too has a large tender, this time carried on two pivoted bogies. Heading an excursion on the former southern lines, Salamiel carries once again the white discs the southern used to indicate, for signalman's benefit, the route a train was taking. Notice the third rail too, supplying power for electric trains, which began taking over from steam in the southern around the time of the First World War. In the 1930s, the railway companies began a much more scientific method of testing their locomotives using the most advanced technology of the day. Lord Nelson, who gave his name to the entire class, carries a removable shelter at the front, housing indicators, recording equipment and staff carried as part of the test. As a result of these tests, the Lord Nelsons were given modified blast pipes and bigger chimneys. These were intended to upgrade their performance. Lord Nelson is wearing the Southern's distinctive bright green Malachite livery. This locomotive also is now part of the National Collection. On the Great Western Railway, the famous King class marked the zenith of Swindon steam. Their massive good looks are quite unmistakable. Introduced in 1927, the Kings also benefited from ongoing trials and research. In the 1930s, they were fitted with better superheating, and then, in the 1950s, double chimneys. So by the time they were 30 years old, the Kings were running better than at any time in their entire lives. King Edward I is in superb condition, Hard to believe it was acquired in derelict condition from Barry Scrapyard in South Wales. Another movie tone scoop. It's September 1931 and the Great Western Railway has accelerated its schedules to make its Cheltenham Flyer the world's fastest train, beating a record briefly held by the Canadian Pacific Railway. The route follows the Great Western's superb main line along the Thames Valley and Launceston Castle is going flat out. Water troughs again, an essential feature of record-breaking journeys. 
Engineers were constantly searching for ideas which might radically improve the steam locomotive and Hush Hush had been the watchword for the building of this prototype. Designed by Nigel Gresley on the London and North Eastern Railway, it made its debut at the close of 1929. At the locomotive depot at King's Cross, the press pack is out again in force to record this futuristic looking locomotive. Gresley's number 10,000, which was painted garter blue with silver hoops, featured a unique high pressure boiler of a type that had proved very successful in shipping. Ordered from a Glasgow company of marine engineers, this boiler took over four years to design and build. A shape like this had never been seen before. The Hush Hush ran the original trials well enough but its early promise was not fully realised and the engine proved troublesome and costly to maintain. In 1937 it was rebuilt as an orthodox express locomotive and survived until the 1950s. In 1933, the LMS unveiled its brand new Stania Pacific Princess Royal class, and of course, Movie Tone News was there. This is Britain's most powerful engine, built by the London Midland and Scottish Railway to haul in the heavy Scots trains between Euston and Glasgow. the maiden journey of the new locomotive on the LMS Scottish run. The engine has been named after Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal and she is expected to break all records. To help win maximum publicity, the LMS laid on a special press train, running on a parallel track out of London Euston for the newsreel cameramen. This is Harrow and Wealdston station. No expense spared. A hired light aircraft carried yet another cameraman. Although the Princess Royals were by far the largest engines the LMS had used until that time, and despite Movietone's confident prediction, the class didn't initially break many records. What they did do, however, was cut out the need for a second engine on heavy trains over the hilly main line to Scotland. One of two survivors is the second engine of the class, named after then Princess Elizabeth, now of course Her Majesty the Queen. Another LMS type of this period to make a less than brilliant debut was William Stanier's medium sized three cylinder 460. First appearing in 1934, the class was christened Jubilees when King George V celebrated that event the following year. But with early problems resolved, nearly 200 Jubilees were built, most bearing the patriotic names of British colonies, admirals and warships. Like other LMS designs, the Jubilees worked over much of mainland Britain and these well proportioned and ultimately very successful engines became well loved favourites right up until their end in 1967. By contrast, the Silver Jubilee train that went into service in 1935 was the LNER's state-of-the-art streamlined express. A story of speed on the railway. The Silver Jubilee train, latest streamlined wonder of the LNER, leaves King's Cross on her record-making trial run. Cutting the film to help you get the sense of speed, 
We take you into the air in a plane itself traveling at over 100 miles an hour. At one point, the Silver Jubilee reached 112 miles an hour, and it looks like it. The engine for this record-breaking train was the first of Nigel Gresley's world-famous A4-class streamliners, Silverlink, built straight off the drawing board. Their peak of fame came on July 3rd, 1938, when Mallard set a world speed record for steam of 126 miles per hour between Grantham and Peterborough. It's a record that will almost certainly stand for all time. Away from the comparatively level racetrack of the East Coast Main Line, and nearly 50 years later, Mallard got the chance to get to grips with the steep gradients of the famous Settling Carlisle Line. A4 Sir Nigel Gresley, the 100th Gresley Pacific, was named after the famous designer, who received a knighthood in 1936. The testing climb up the Loon Valley to Shap Fell was once enemy territory. It was on the old LMS's more demanding rival route to Scotland. Back in 1937, King George VI's coronation year, the speed record for steam was being passed back and forth between the LMS and the rival LMR. The LMS set their coronation engine the task of attacking the British record and our aerial cameraman Jack Carter follows above and alongside in a plane flying at 100 miles an hour. The result is the record with a top speed of 114 miles per hour. That Empire record, which lasted just a year until Mallard beat it, was established by Sir William Stanier's new streamlined Pacific Coronation, a larger development of his Princess Royal class. The streamlining, unlike the rest of the locomotive, was not entirely successful, and later members of the class were built without it. Those built with it saw it removed. Although on face value everything looked fine, beneath the glamour of the 1930s, all was not well on our railways. Movie Tone News interviewed LMS chairman Lord Stamp. Station entrances and hoardings in Britain have been placarded with arresting slogans during the past fortnight. Perturbed by the ominous words, we asked Lord Stamp what it was all about. He told us that there had been a five million drop in railway receipts this year. It seems that the terms on which railways operate were fixed a hundred years ago before there was any road transport to challenge their supremacy. Road transport, which has become so efficient in recent years, is not bound by the limitations which Parliament put upon the railway monopoly of those early years. So despite the strenuous efforts made by the railway systems to meet competition by new rolling stock, improvement of services and acceleration of time schedules on the long runs, they still find themselves handicapped by the regulations devised all those many years ago. Having seen the arrival at Euston of the Coronation Scot, in case you wondered what train it was, we'll have a final word from Lord Stamp. Our receipts are dropping alarmingly. Matters are urgent. Prosperous railways are essential to prosperous commerce, and therefore to a prosperous nation. They could not be ready to help in wartime if they are weak in peacetime. All we are asking for is a square deal a fair field and no favour. The state of freight in December 1938, with Lord Stamp clearly anticipating the coming war. During the hostilities, locomotive design concentrated on simplicity, economy and ease of maintenance. The Southern's very unusual Q1s of 1942 possessed all these qualities, plus a very wide operational range. 
achieved by stripping out every ounce of unnecessary weight so the engines could run over lightly laid branch lines and bridges. Although Stanier's Class 8 F freight engines had already been chosen as a standard for overseas war service, there was still a further need for a simplified version, built right down to austerity standards. This led to Robert Riddle's War Department class of 1943, turned out by the hundred in both 280 and 210 versions. These were rather plain workhorses. Riddle said he didn't care if they were all pushed into the sea as soon as the war was over. In fact, by 1945, the WDs had proved themselves ideal for their task, and far from being pushed into the sea, hundreds were repatriated to join those still working in Britain. With the crying need for serviceable locomotives, these WDs went on to work for another 20 years on British railways, to the very end of steam, in August 1968. One enigmatic exception to the wartime building programme was the Southern's Merchant Navy class, designed by Oliver Bullied. Though clearly an express passenger Pacific, the Merchant Navies were mischievously described by Bullied as mixed traffic so as to comply with the government's wartime construction diktat forbidding the building of express locomotives. By 1946, and despite post-war constraints, some things were starting to return to normal. The Flying Scotsman, Britain's best-known express, gives passengers a sight they haven't seen since 1941. Restaurant cars and railway kitchens are back again. Wars may come and wars may go, but the sausage goes on forever. For men who've been off the job for four years, the chefs look pretty slick. But Chef Hock and Cook Humek are old hands at the game. Today's diners are on utility lines, ordinary Pullman coaches with tablecloths added. The dining car team were all doing the same job on the same train before the war. And it's not easy to serve the soup when the Scotsman is topping 60 miles an hour. Our cameraman covering the comeback of the dining car reports the food good for the times. Long distance travellers tell veteran conductor Richards they certainly appreciate it. Have you enjoyed your lunch, sir? I've enjoyed it very much indeed, thank you. It's a very pleasant change after about, what is it, four years of sandwiches. I can assure you we're very, very pleased to be back again. And I'm sure the public are pleased also and they deserve it. Thank you. With the war over, leisure travel was back on the agenda once again. And a day at the seaside was a treat to relish. It happened to be fine weather, but I expect London stations would have been like this anyway. The vast majority of people intended to make the most of their first post-war Easter. As it was, the people put up with the crush and the railways coped with the people. That streamlined Coronation Pacific looked pretty war-weary. Luxury travel, by the way, has returned in the shape of the Golden Arrow train, in which you can travel in complete comfort to the coast. After crossing the channel, you board the train again in France. If only this kind of travel were typical of journeys everywhere in Britain. 
But, well, maybe that's too much to hope for yet. The engine featured on the Golden Arrow newsreel was one of Oliver Bullied West Country Pacifics, a smaller version of the Merchant Navy Pacific of 1941. It also carried a so-called air-smoothed casing, which had nothing to do with streamlining and everything to do with mechanical washing plants. Oliver Bullied was a radical steam engineer and his brief had been to take the southern from the bottom to the top of the railway lead table of innovative design. But as might be expected when so many new ideas are introduced all at once, along with the triumphs came disappointments. Heavy maintenance costs were high and, after 1948, when Britain's railways were nationalised, the new regime eventually decided to rebuild all the bullied Pacifics. The air smooth casing was removed, together with the mechanical complexities. The aim was to retain the best mechanical features whilst dispensing with the more troublesome aspects. The result was highly satisfactory. All the merchant navies were converted, and it was only the approaching end of steam in the 1960s that halted the programme halfway through the hundred odd smaller engines of the West Country and Battle of Britain classes. As late as 1961, Members of the West Country class like Heartland were being rebuilt, virtually as new engines. The rebuilt bullied were, to all intents and purposes, the very last in the long line of British passenger locomotives, and their ultimate performance and reputation did them proud. We are very lucky that so many have survived. The West Country class were given the names of towns and landmarks in the holiday counties served by the Old Southern Railway. The directors had, quite rightly, judged this to be good public relations, especially with holiday-making travellers in mind. But even as the bullied Pacifics were being rebuilt, the modernisation plan published in 1955 foresaw the end of steam traction and its replacement by diesel and electric locomotives. Within 13 years, steam would be eliminated from British Railway's main lines, despite the fact that the bullied were being rebuilt with projected working lives of another 20 years or so. But away from the glamour of the main lines, there had been a need for smaller, less spectacular workaday engines for suburban services and branches. These were the tank engines, which carry their water in tanks, instead of a separate tender. The Great Western Railway, under its chief mechanical engineer Churchwood, built 5541 at Swindon in 1928, one of hundreds of similar engines with a 262 or prairie wheel arrangement which allowed the engines to run equally steadily forward and backward. With the comparative luxury of an all-over cab to protect the crew, these tank engines were ideal for short journeys and there was no need to turn the engine between trips. Private railways are essentially old branch lines, which tended not to have large turntables, so tank engines tend to be the first choice, and most private lines have at least one. Their inherent qualities commended them for the new role, and dozens remain active today all round the country. The Great Western also operated a large fleet of pannier tanks, which continued to be built well after the Second World War, even into British Railways days. Panniers have the great advantage of plenty of clear space beneath the tanks, allowing easier access to the frames and motion for day-to-day -day maintenance. They worked on every kind of duty, from local passenger to pick up freights and shunting, all over the Great Western system.
But this is how panniers are best remembered, chuffing quietly along a country line, where speed is not of the essence and business not too demanding. What a glorious day for the driver. Sadly, this was just the sort of picturesque line, however, whose traffic leached away with the coming of the bus, the lorry and the car. Things had been going downhill from the First World War and especially in the 1940s, although during the war many branches were heavily used. By the 1950s, closures were coming thick and fast, so the famous beaching report of 1963 merely hastened a process that was already well underway. The Gresley Class N2062 was built in 1921 for the Great Northern Railway. It was designed for a specific job, hauling heavy commuter traffic between London's northern suburbs and the city itself. The N2 class was distinctive in that it was fitted with condensing gear. This enabled the exhausted steam from the cylinders to be condensed and returned to the water tanks instead of being sent into the atmosphere. This helped make the engines more economical and made conditions on the footplate much more bearable in the two-mile tunnel on the Great Northern Line into the city from King's Cross to Moorgate. Many of Britain's railways also needed a selection of mixed traffic locomotives, which were designed with something of a compromise between speed and power. This produced an engine of intermediate size, like the S15 Class 460, built for the London and South Western Railway in 1920. These locomotives would be equally at home on passenger or freight trains. Medstead and Foremark station is on the Mid Hants Railway, which is marketed today as the Watercress Line. Situated west of Alton in Hampshire, the station lies on a hilly section of line known as the Alps. This railway was once a through route from Alton to Winchester, and double heading of all but the lightest trains was common. It was closed by British Rail in 1973, and the section now in use from Alton to Alsford was back in use by 1985. The code 6F, painted above the locomotive number, indicates the engine's power rating on a scale rising from 0 to 9, while the F indicates that it's primarily designed for freight working. This particular locomotive spent its life working from the Southern Railway's vast Feltham Freight Complex in West London. Note once again the watercart bogey tender the southern have no water troughs, remember. In 1934, the LMS introduced what must surely be the most famous mixed traffic design of all time, the Stania Black 5. This was classified as a true mixed traffic engine with a power rating code 5 MT. The Black Fives quickly proved themselves masters of practically every kind of train in the timetable, including famous long distance services like the Thames Clyde Express and the Devonian. They were strong, economical, free steaming, easy riding and very popular with their crews. They were known as the Fireman's Friends.
Such was the success of these versatile machines that no fewer than 842 were eventually built, construction being spread between three LMS workshops and two outside contractors. William Stanier retired in 1944, but his successors, Fairburn and Ivert, continued production with only minor modifications. The last Black Five was completed in 1951, three years after nationalisation and 17 years after the Vulcan foundry had built the first. It's hardly a surprise that no fewer than 18 Black Fives survive, and many of these are now regularly active on our steam railways. 44806 on the Langothlan Railway in North Wales was built at Derby in 1944, and spent a thoroughly uneventful working life in the Leicester and Nottingham areas, before ending up at Liverpool in the final days of steam. Black 5 George Stevenson was the only member of its class to be fitted with the special Stevenson Link valve gear. Every other member of the class was fitted with the lighter and more easily maintained Walsh Arts valve gear. On the Great Western Railway, the equivalent of the Black Five was the Hall Class 460, so called because they were all named after stately homes, first in the Great Western's home area and then, as the list of available names began to run out, rather further afield. halls, designed by Collett, emerged from the Great Western Swindon Works in 1928. Unlike the Black Fives, which they closely paralleled in size and power, the halls came from a long continuous line of Great Western development. The LMS Black Five had been a deliberate new design, although it owed much to the hall. The halls were highly successful and well-liked performers, and 330 were eventually built. Hence the problem with names. The last 70 engines of the class, built between 1944 and 1949, were produced under Hawksworth, who made modifications in the light of experience with the earlier series. Modified Witherslack Hall, whose namesake is actually in the Lake District, looks very smart in the lined black livery of the late 1940s. The Great Western also had a need for a lighter version of the hall to work over its secondary lines such as the Cambrian system in rural Wales, which it absorbed in the 1920s. So, Collett introduced the smaller Manor class in 1938, tipping the scales at several tonnes less than a hall, though packing plenty of power. The trade-off in weight was achieved, as ever in locomotive design, by using smaller driving wheels, which in turn meant lower top speeds. But on secondary routes, this was no real loss. Twenty manors were built before the war, with a further ten in the nationalised British Railways days. Nine of the thirty are still with us, providing ideal motive power for our steam railways.
1951, the South Bank Festival of Britain both prompted and reflected a patriotic mood. So Britannia was an appropriate choice for the first British Railways Standard Express engine, built that year. The name also reflected the newly unified state of our railways. Nationalisation had taken place just three years before. This was not at all an easy time for the railways. The war had left the system on its knees and in desperate need of colossal investment. In its place came massive political and organisational turmoil. Against this unpromising background, Robert Riddles was charged with designing a complete new range of standard steam locomotives. This new range was planned to replace a multitude of obsolete and worn-out pre-war types. The Britannias, designated as a mixed traffic class 7, were the first, the best known and amongst the most successful of them. Duke of Gloucester was built in 1954 as a one-off express passenger locomotive to try and set mainline steam on a new and more efficient course. Results were mixed, but sadly, the end of the steam era was already being plotted, and follow-up trials and modifications were not pursued. At the other end of the scale from the one-off Duke were the Class 5 460s, based heavily on the Stanier Black 5s. Very much a production line job with over 170 built, they were well liked and worked all over the system. A number of standard fives went new to the southern region, where they took over the duties and also the names of withdrawn King Arthur class 460s. Camelot heads a Bluebell railway train made up of the southern green stock which was once so typical of the area. Rather similar in appearance to the Class 5s, but lighter, were the Class 4 460s, very much a parallel with the Manor class on the Great Western whose work they took over in the 1960s. As Robert Riddle's standard classes came on stream, the need for greater economy and efficiency on the railways was growing by the day. The LMS's Lord Stamp had warned before the war about the threat from road transport towards freight. By about 1950, both freight and passenger traffic were again falling alarmingly. Road hauliers prospered as never before, while the private car was now slowly coming within everyone's means. However efficient the new locomotives, steam railways were fighting a losing battle. Footplate crews on the standard classes enjoyed working conditions which were greatly improved on earlier locomotives. Of course, the hours remained as unsocial as ever and the work was still hard and dirty. You simply can't get away from the realities of coal, ash and oil. The controls are now conveniently to hand and the engine has a roomy, covered cab whilst driver and fireman have well-positioned seats. It's all very different from the Spartan conditions of 40 years earlier. The fireman generally rides on the right-hand side of British steam locomotives. 
fluids and, when not shoveling coal and managing the boiler, assist the driver with the sighting of signals, a very important job. This section of the old Great Central Railway was built as an express main line, with many stations constructed in the form of an island platform, serving trains in both directions. This was much cheaper than building two platforms. That's the driver applying the brake. The fireman swaps tokens, which are the driver's authority to run over single line sections of track, an essential safety system. Steam locomotives are hard work. Each one requires a crew of two, and furthermore, someone has to be on duty hours before the first train to light the fire, raise steam, and oil all the moving parts. Back on shed at the end of a working day, the fire must then be removed, ash shoveled out, and more coal and water taken on. All this is very time consuming and labour intensive. For an industry battling to reduce costs, it was far from ideal. Small wonder then that in the difficult days of the 1950s, diesel and electric traction were being seen as the only way ahead for the railways. On top of all this, a loco men's strike lasting nearly three weeks in 1955 caused prolonged chaos and highlighted even more the disadvantages of steam and its manning. The strike was over the pay differentials expected by loco crews, but in such an unfavourable climate, its effect on customers and on government thinking would in time prove hugely damaging to the railways in general. To steam in particular, it was a mortal blow. Meantime, the standard construction programme rolled on. The first of these two engines is a Class 4 260, one notch down from the very similar 460 Class 5 behind. The 260 wheel arrangement was always known as a mogul, and 78022 was a direct development of a type built in quantity on the old LMS by Ivert. These small Class 2 mixed traffic moguls were excellent performers for their modest size, and because of their light axle loading, they could go just about anywhere. Unfortunately, many of the rural lines they were built for were closing as the engines came off the production line. 65 were built, and the later engines, from the mid-1950s, found little in the way of hard work in their all-too-brief lives. Our standard locomotive range included three tank engines, with the 4MT as the largest. It was also the best and certainly the most useful, seeing hard graft in urban commuter areas as well as general work elsewhere. The slippery rails on the steep branch line from Landudno to Blanau Festiniog in North Wales proved to be rather tougher than expected for one 4MT and a second engine had to be drafted in to bank the train.
By the early 1960s, many of the commuter service the Class 4s had been designed for had either been electrified or dieselised, and indeed a number of them came to rural Wales for their last years with BR. The last of the standards to appear was the Class 9F Heavy Freight 210. With the return of hundreds of Stanier and War Department 280s from the war, new freight engines had not been a top priority, and it wasn't until 1954 that the first of the 9Fs emerged from Crew Works. Once teething problems had been resolved, the 9Fs quickly won acclaim and went on to become the most successful of all the standard classes. In fact, they were amongst the best of all British locomotives. The 9Fs were the most numerous of all the standard designs, with 251 built. The 10 coupled wheels had come from Robert Riddle's experience with the water WD 210s, and they gave excellent adhesion. One or two modifications were made during production. Later members of the class were fitted with double chimneys. At five feet in diameter, the wheels were rather larger than on other heavy freight engines, and this meant the 9Fs were notably fleet of foot. During busy summer weekends, they were seen on passenger work with speeds in the 80s and even the 90s recorded. The sad day when steam production ceased in Britain naturally captured the attention of the national press, TV and the newsreels. Swindon and a new locomotive that's already historic. The last steam loco to be built by British Railways. The official unveiling revealed its appropriate name. Evening Star points to the inevitable end of a very popular age, the age of steam. It's always been locos like this that made boys want to be engine drivers. Perhaps boys of today are mad about diesels, but they're not the same thing at all in my opinion. Evening Star is the last of a long and honourable life. The last of the steamers. From its first day, Evening Star was inevitably earmarked for preservation when withdrawn. But, along with many others of its class, this splendid engine had a scandalously short life of just five working years. Such waste did not reflect well either on railway management or politicians, whatever the pressures they were under. In the 1960s, the writing was very clearly on the wall for steam. One noticeable symptom was the relegation of once proud express engines to humble freight duties and their filthy, unkempt condition. For many rail fans, these were indeed sad days. It's a tribute to the robustness of the steam locomotive that so many kept going with so little maintenance and care. Riddle's wartime WDs in particular still chuffed and clanked their way around the country in the most appalling state. And these were the engines once destined to be pushed into the sea as soon as the war was over. Diesels and electrics swept all before them and for the final year from July 1967 
the only remaining steamworked area of Britain was the northwest. Even in the last years, spectacular steam action like this could still be enjoyed. And these water troughs at Dillicar between Preston and Carlisle on the main line to Scotland were in daily use, virtually to the end of steam. The line includes the climb over Shap Fell, in steam days the best known mainline gradient in Britain, with its four miles of 1 in 75 northbound from T-Bay. The Wildfell countryside, where most heavy goods trains needed a banking engine, made a marvellous backdrop for cameramen catching these poignant moments of history. By the spring of 1968, the coming end of steam had even caught the imagination of the general public. The Iron Horse was to be consigned to the history books, and a series of specials and charter trains ran to commemorate the event. Many of the engines on these specials were old favourites, like the Stanier Black Fives. And, as the last few trains passed, enthusiasts consoled each other. Leading engine Oliver Cromwell, complete with a suitable wreath, was the last of the Britannia Pacifics in service. And so, to the very last day of steam, Sunday, August the 11th, 1968. The final run was the infamous 15 guinea special which was double-headed on its return portion over the settling Carlisle line. It would be ten years before steam would again cross the famous Ribblehead Viaduct. This massive structure, a real icon of the steam age, also came close to being discarded some 15 years later when the line was proposed for closure by British Rail. And so, steam under BR heads home for the very last time. 44871 on the front lives on in preservation but the second loco didn't make it. It was scrapped after starring in the Virgin Soldiers. Elsewhere in Britain too, steam had already paid the ultimate price. Good old steam locos, nothing to touch them. Their days are numbered and the real veterans are being broken up. Here at Swindon, where many thousands have been built over the past hundred years or so, the old timers are being turned into scrap. Rather sad, really. And it does seem a harsh fate after all the faithful service they've given. Most of this lot date from the 1920s. But they won't be quite forgotten. There's a big demand for the old number plates as souvenirs for collectors. Still progress is progress, I suppose, and British Railways must diesel up. Scrapyards around the country made a lot of money in the 1960s cutting up locomotives. Ironically, this one near Kettering in the East Midlands later became a giant graveyard for motor cars, which had been built using the metal from old steam engines. At Barry in South Wales, Dye Woodham's yard built hundreds of engines, but instead of cutting them up straight away, the gas axe fell first on the much easier goods wagons, which just kept on arriving. So the steam engines stood, quietly rusting away, 
and, incredibly, most were still there in the early 1970s, when a number of branches began to be reopened privately, and the preservationists started looking round for engines needed to run them. Geography had meant that the lion's share of Barry engines were former Great Western and Southern types. But there was a surprising smattering of others, including one or two most unlikely candidates, like the one-off Duke of Gloucester, minus one of its cylinders and valve gear, which had been donated to the Science Museum in London. This original bullied Pacific has huge holes in its air smoothed casing, but that's very much a surface wound and incredibly nearly all the 200 engines at Barry have survived into a new life, many to steam again. Not all locomotives went for scrap, the select few were taken straight out of service and went directly into private hands. Artist David Shepherd was one of the few people lucky enough to be in a position to buy his very own locomotive. If I'm known at all, I'm known as the bloke who paints elephants. And way back in 1967, which was the year when we were throwing away our steam age, dozens of brand new engines were cut up for scrap, five years old, what a waste. I had a one-man show in New York of wildlife paintings, and the whole lot sold in the first evening. And I came back without thinking what I was doing. I always act, you see, I'm, I'm so sort of impetuous, I don't think. I always act first and then think afterwards. If I thought afterwards, there wouldn't be a Black Prince. Impetuosity, I picked up the phone, rang up Bridge Rail and said, can I buy a steam engine? Two, actually, because I bought the Green Knight as well. And they said, good Lord, if you're stupid enough to buy two, why do you want two? And anyway, the long story of it was that on that phone call, I bought Black Prince for £3,000. But, and it's a very big but, it's a different world now. And perhaps people don't realise the extent to which we have taken on a horror story in a sense, because Black Prince, whilst I love her, has given me all my grey hairs, all my worry, all my bank overdrafts. Why my wife is still married to me, I don't know, I don't understand. She's cost a monumental amount of money. And now she's, as I speak, due for an overhaul in probably two months' time. The boiler comes off for the first time ever, and it's costing probably £60,000. We are appealing for money now to help her restoration, because I can't afford it. She's owning her own keep now, She's been on the Gloucester and Warwickshire Railway for nearly a year now, and we have a contract with them that they steam her 50 times a year, and all that money they pay into the bank account. She has her own bank account, so she's paying for herself. It has to be, otherwise she won't be restored. But she is raising the money, so she will be restored, and I want her to outlive me. I'm 70, and I want to, her to outlive me. On BR, steam was banned completely after the last rites of August 1968 but pressure from steam lovers was always bound to tell in time and, in autumn 1971, the breakthrough was made by the famous Great Western 460, King George V. It had been preserved for some time in mainline running order at the Bulmer Railway Centre in Hereford. The engine's first runs, with Bulmer's rake of preserved Pullman coaches, were kept quite low-key, but they were the forerunners of a whole new age of preserved mainline steam. The delightful Welsh Marchers line between Newport, Hereford and Shrewsbury was the rather unlikely venue for these historic trips. But there was plenty of interest and the runs were a great morale booster for railway lovers everywhere. The first steam engines permitted back onto BR tended to be famous and historic crowd pullers, with many drawn from the national collection. With what cynics considered the bad old days of steam still in recent memory, it was absolutely vital that the engines used were reliable and in top-rate mechanical order. Even so, Hardwick, built in 1892, makes an unlikely pairing with Evening Star, built in 1960. The Great Western Pendennis Castle 
was preserved privately. In 1925, when only a few months old, this engine had run a number of high-profile comparative trials on the LNER, whilst a Gresley A3 Pacific did similar tests on the Great Western. Pendennis Castle came out on top. In the 1970s, this famous engine was sold for preservation in Australia, but happily it is now back home once more. The famous apple green livery shows up well on this LNER pair. B1 number 1306 is preserved privately, whilst class leader Gresley V2 Green Arrow belongs to the National Railway Museum. Double heading of steam specials was commonplace at this period. It guarded against the possibility of failure of one locomotive, whilst doubling the interest for enthusiasts. This time, the B1 is leading the most famous preserved locomotive of them all, Flying Scotsman. The first two vehicles are restored wooden-bodied LNER carriages, a practice no longer permitted on the rail track network. In 30 years of preserved steam operation on the main line, many locomotives have tended to enjoy sporadic periods in traffic, interspersed with spells off the active list. There are simply not the resources, nor indeed the demand, to keep all of them active all the time. Over the years, the number of main line routes cleared for steam running has steadily improved. The famous Settling Carlisle line, with its challenging gradients in both directions, has been a favourite since 1978, when mainline steam returned. The superb Coronation Class Pacific, Duchess of Hamilton, raises the echoes. An early pioneer of restored steam on the main line was Jubilee Leander. Withdrawn in 1964, it languished in Barry Scrapyard for eight years, before private rescue and then overhaul at British Rail's Derby workshops. Streamlined A4 Pacific Sir Nigel Gresley ran for many years in original Garter Blue as number 4498. While steam on the main line in the UK is confined to the occasional run by a preserved engine, for rail fans who are prepared to travel, it's a very different story. Changes in international politics, coupled with comparatively cheap airfares, mean that thousands of rail fans now regularly visit remote outposts like China, Poland and Cuba. The Caribbean island of Cuba still sees lots of steam action during the comparatively short sugar season when an amazing variety of vintage steam locomotives are pressed into service every day, including this oil fired Baldwin built in 1915 at Espartaco Mill. Still officially a closed communist country, at least as far as the USA is concerned. Most of the American locomotives from Alco and Baldwin are left over from the old plantations, once managed by American companies before the communist takeover led by Fidel Castro. Each individual mill maintains its own small fleet of locomotives. This Alco is based at Orlando Gonzalez Ramirez, which it was originally built for in 1920. Just how long steam will remain at work in Q 
Cuba depends on future relations with the USA. If the current trade embargo is ever lifted, it's likely that American money and goods will flood the island, quickly replacing most of the ancient equipment. By a quirk of fate, the honour of being the world's last working mainline steam, in any serious numbers, will fall to the Chinese QJ. The Giant 2102 is based on a Russian design, dating from 1957, and indeed, the first locomotives were built with Russian help. Over 4,700 QJs were built, no one is really sure just how many are left, but it's likely there are now fewer than 1,000 still at work. Running through remote Inner Mongolia, the 840 km Jitong line, which only opened in 1996, is still 100% steam worked, and it uses just over 100 QJs to work a spectacular railway, including the now famous Jinping Pass. Production of these fine engines lasted for 30 years, with numerous detailed differences and modifications. There are many variations within the class, the most noticeable being the 8 or 12 wheel tenders and the all weather cab windows fitted to some locomotives. Steam railway readers were amongst the first groups of rail fans to regularly visit Poland in 1994 to sample everyday revenue earning steam trains, somewhat closer to home than China or Cuba. The small town of Wolstein, in the west of the country, not too far from the German border, is the focal point of Polish steam operations and has become a mecca for steam starved rail fans from around the world. Backbone of Wallstein's fleet are six OL49 class 262s. 
These are modern passenger tender engines, with 115 being built up to 1953. The stud of OL49s are staple power for Walstein's passenger turns, including four return trips to the historic city of Poznan every day. Although Walstein is designated as a museum depot, it's a 100% working shed with workshops and coaling facilities. There are no cafeterias, gift shops or public loos, although visiting rail fans can spend the night in the adjoining local men's hostel at reasonable rates. Walstein's big two tenos are often rostered for duty on the rapidly diminishing local freight trips. These distinctive decapods are variants of the famous German Kriegslok or war locomotive, built by the thousand both during and after the Second World War. An amazing feature of Walstein steam operations is the opportunity for rail fans to drive and fire mainline locomotives on service trains, under supervision, of course. The Walstein experience, the marketing name for this incredible scheme, extends the concept of footplate tuition offered by many UK private lines to its logical next step, mainline running, and provides an unforgettable and thrilling few days. Pacific PM36 is an experimental type and one of a class of just two engines. Judging from number two's efforts, the experiment can be considered somewhat successful. The United Kingdom steam railways have also proved incredibly successful and since 1968 they've grown into a million pound tourist industry. Although they still rely largely on volunteer labour, today's preserve railways are big business. It's often not enough to simply run a timetable steam service and to flourish most lines have to stage a wide range of popular events including Santa Specials and Thomas the Tank Engine Days, as well as Enthusiast Weekends and Charter Specials. Of course, if British Rail had had its way, mainline steam would have finished in 1968, and the Iron Horse would have been banished forever to just a few museums and railways. Instead, after many years of ups and downs, Steam can now be seen regularly at mainline speeds in nearly all parts of the country, including the famous Dawlish coastal route in Devon. Interest from both holiday makers and rail fans is as strong as ever and there was enough demand to run a twice daily main line steam service in August 2001. In the early 1980s, the many steam excursions using the Settle and Carlisle line helped to publicise the threat to this beautiful and useful route which British Rail was trying its best to close. After a long battle, the line was reprieved, and steam in the 21st century is now a regular feature. There's no doubt that the attraction of a steam engine really can wean tourists off the roads, providing it's properly marketed. In recent years, visitors to London have been able to enjoy regular mainline steam with the Cathedral's Express, taking them to either Canterbury, Salisbury or Bath. Who would have thought it? 
undoubtedly the most famous and regular mainline summer steam operation, is from Fort William to Malague. The formula of stunning scenery and working steam has proved to be a winning combination since the route was first passed for steam working back in 1984. The story of steam in the UK could also easily have ended in August 1968, but thanks largely to the continued efforts of an unsung army of volunteers, the steam engine today can still be seen in many of its different guises. No doubt the future will be even more exciting. No longer content with rebuilding existing engines, some of today's rail fans are now raising funds to commission brand new steam locomotives from scratch. Well, that's the essence of the story of steam, but of course it's a story which is still going on. You can still see steam locomotives in all shapes and sizes in action at railways at dozens of locations all over Britain every weekend. And if you really want to keep up to date with what's going on with British steam, then make sure you read Steam Railway magazine every four weeks. That's all from me. 